If you have ever struggled with mental health challenges or you know someone who has, you will definitely benefit from this in-depth conversation I had with licensed professional counselor and my good, good friend, Stacy Stone. Hey, what's up? If this is your first time listening to the pod, this is the Build Your Vision podcast. I'm Clee the Visionary. This is the number one faith-based podcast personal growth show for visionaries only for those who are serious not just curious about building a life and business they are proud of in this episode we discuss a myriad of things like prayer versus therapy how to navigate mental health challenges of those you love how to process grief and trauma uh, book recommendations for mental health what do you do when you lose focus and feel overwhelmed and lots and lots more this was a very very good conversation and as a visionary your mental health will i repeat will be challenged you have to be mentally strong to build your vision because the process is hard the process is challenging and the more you understand about your mental health the better you can navigate it so let's just be a little fly on the wall of this rather candid conversation i have with stacy stone you're listening to the build your vision podcast a podcast series about maneuvering the ups and downs of building a life that you're proud of, captured in real time. A community where dreamers become doers, and doers become world changers. Let's go. I had a very, very long conversation about this the other day with some mm. with somebody that has experienced a fair share of trauma. And of course, that's going to impact their mental health. And we were talking about the concept of prayer. Oh, and mm. how does prayer play into this? Because you have one side that's like, pray, pray it away. And then you have another uh-huh. side that's like, prayer don't help. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. What are your views on the effectiveness or the approach to mm-hmm. spirituality and prayer when it comes to your mental health? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, Cleavon, because whenever you, we talked about this podcast, I was like, oh, this will be great fun. Let's talk to, let's do a podcast. And then the doctor adjusted the allergy medicines for me. So if I sound a little bit stuffy or, you know, oh. just <laughs> keep, just keep going. Okay. So where my stand is, is that prayer is part of the process. Okay. Prayer is always part of the process for me personally. And also I, I, I'm kind of blessed because my pastor is Mark Patterson. <laughs> so real quick, just to fill you in, if you don't know who Mark Patterson is, he's an amazing pastor of the National Community Church here in Washington, D.C., and he is a prolific and amazing author. One of my favorites has multiple best selling books. In fact, a lot of them or some of them are in my resource library um, in my online community, Vision Entrepreneur School. So if you want to check out some of his books, you could go over there and check that out. Plus all the other books that Stacy mentions in this episode, I will be putting in the description. So just want to fill you in if you didn't know who Mark Patterson is. Check him out. And so you'll hear me say my pastor a lot during this, Mm -hmm. but he specifically says work as if it's up to you and pray as if it's up to God. Yes. So work portion of this is going to counseling, taking your medication, doing what you're provided to take care of yourself in this world and then pray also. And so it's not something that you put on top of. It's not something you put in front of, but I cannot tell you my heart breaks over and over and over again. I'll be sitting across from someone just like this because I do all telehealth and they'll say that someone at church said, why don't you just pray harder? Mm -hmm. Their dad just died or their husband left them or they lost their jobs. And it's just like you make the person feel like a failure. Mm -hmm. That's as simple as I can get it. The other one is you don't have strong enough faith. Your faith just isn't strong enough. Well, Mm. This is a fallen world we live in. It's a world that God created, but it didn't turn out the way that he created it. Mm-hmm. And so we have to live here. And sometimes it just feels uncomfortable yeah. to live here for us. My poor mother, because I used to sit next to her in church, and she would literally, when the pastor started on something like this, because we were in a very traditional church, and he would say something like this, and she would grab my knee so I didn't stand up in church. <laughs> So from a young age, you were, you you know, 
mm-hmm. and advocate. Hellfire and brimstone. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think that may be one of the reasons that I began this whole journey to being a licensed counselor, actually. Wow. Yeah. So what inspired mm-hmm. that in your life? Because I think pretty much everything has a reason. So like mm-hmm. what life experiences made you so aware and so uh, passionate mm-hmm. about this area and sector? Oh, that. Mm. so I was, obviously we talked about the fact that I was raised in that type of church. I loved that church. Mm. And so don't, I loved that church and it was where I accepted Christ, everything. So put that aside for just a minute. And I, as a child, I always struggled with my weight always. And so I was severely bullied and that was part of it. But also I was a senior, I was going to be a senior in high school, actually. And I was waking up in the morning. My mom came in and she sat on the side of my bed and she was crying. And I was like, what's, what's wrong? And she said, Phil killed himself last night. And I was like, what did you say? (laughs) It was like, she said, Phil killed himself last night. And I said, our Phil? And she said, yeah. So Phil was a student with me all the way through high school. He was the senior class president. They're going to be. Oh my goodness. He had obviously struggled and none of us knew it. That was the, that was the part that broke me. Whenever we would talk to him about college, he would say, Oh, I'm going to go to the university of Hawaii so I can get out of here. Mm -hmm. And it should have been a clue to somebody to go, why? But we were just high school students. Yeah. And so I think that moment right there was when everything flipped for me. And I knew I was planning on going into sports because I wanted to work for the Dallas Cowboys. (laughs) Yes, which we will not. We will not talk about them on this show. (laughs) I know, I know, but that's when it all flipped. And so my first degree is in psychology. Wow. Yeah, and from there, yeah, God had big plans. Wow. And I know that we pre-interview you had some things about the church and what the church has not been helping with when it comes mm-hmm. to this area. Did you already kind of touch on those things, but it was just like pray more. I did a little faith, bit, or... but one thing I want to point out is that sometimes we talk negatively about the church, mm-hmm. but the church is actually individual people. Mm-hmm. And so we are a group of people that are together and we do attend in the same building or the same church in different locations, mm-hmm. but we are individual people. And so I just want to point out that there are pastors like pastor Batterson also, Mike Todd, several that I could list down. Rick Warren, his wife, Kay, talks constantly mm-hmm. about getting seeking help in this way. We also have artists. Obviously, Selena Gomez is very, very open about this. And also Brandon Lake, who is a Christian artist. Mm-hmm. He shares it constantly. I mean, he wrote a song called Help right in the middle of a panic attack. Mm-hmm. And so we have people that are leading the way. But we have to figure out some way to stop the stigma. That's the cue. The key to the stigma is not just in the church. Our society created a stigma. Yeah. And we are not taking care of these people in the proper way. And so that's my soapbox. If I could stand before Congress or do a TED talk, that's my soapbox. Let's dig into that a little bit, because earlier you said going to counseling or getting therapy is not just for you, it's for others as well. Mm-hmm. And as the church is a group of people. Society is a mm-hmm. group of people, right? Mm-hmm. How do we as individual human beings equip ourselves to help those that are having more challenges in this area than we are? Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a few people in my life that I know I have been at a loss of words, actions, anything, because I don't know how to process what they're going through at all. Mm-hmm. So like, how can we do that? Well, we are expecting your generation, Gen Z, to change all of this. And so it might sound like a heavy load for your generation, but we're very, very hopeful that you can continue to talk about this in the open. That's one of the things, you know, that, you know, even doing this podcast, just talking about it constantly is one of the things. Education. It may be something that you have an app on your phone or you read a newsletter that somebody sends out, whatever it might be, educate yourself. Know that 
this is this and this is this. And when somebody's feeling this way, it may be this. If somebody's sad, it could lead to depression, but it really could just be sadness, which is another really good point, which is, yeah, empathy versus diagnosis. Another big soapbox. Mm. But yeah. But at the same time, you understand that when someone is going through something like you were talking about and they're sitting across from you and they're talking about how they just have this hole in their chest Mm -hmm. that they just feel like they cannot fill because they've had some form of loss, then it's probably grief or sadness. But the best thing you can do is listen and not listen to respond. Actually, listen. There's a very funny movie that I cannot recommend that. (laughs) (laughs) I have a a few of those, actually. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, exactly. And I have watched it over and over again. But in the movie, they talk about sitters. Uh And it's a very funny thing. The young man loses something. And this elderly group of women come into his house. And he comes in. And they're all sitting in his living room, knitting or reading or whatever. And he's like, what are you doing here? And we're sitters. We do this when someone loses something or someone we come and we sit and that group of women were what got him through, even though they didn't offer him any advice. They didn't say, oh, we understand what you're going through. They didn't tell him to get all prayed up. Nothing. They sat. And it's Toby Mac tells a beautiful story about that. Wow. Whenever his son died, yeah. John Reddick, who is his music pastor, mm-hmm. actually at his church, he's also an artist, just came to his house and played the piano. That's all he did for hours and hours and hours on end. So as people were coming in and out saying, we're so sorry, we can't believe this. True, it's gone. This is, this is such a tragedy. John Reddick just came and played the piano constantly. He didn't say anything. And so it really can be, sometimes it's just a presence and not running away from the situation. Oh, Man, I see people run away. Mm -hmm. I really do, especially in a situation like that, yeah, where it's just a pure tragedy all the way across. Of course, Toby has turned it around now, and but it's it was such a severe loss. But yeah, it's sometimes it's just sitting, but it's also education and it's also listening to podcasts like this. I think that probably my default is Mm -hmm. to distance myself. Mm -hmm. It's twofold in that purpose because. When initial trauma happens, that's public. There's an onslaught of attention Mm -hmm. and energy required to make sure everyone feels appreciated for their attention. Mm -hmm. And I've never been a person of many words unless like it's something that I'm very passionate about or or someone asks me. I'm not just going to be up there like offering, (laughs) you know. (laughs) Just talking all the time. Mm -hmm. So I usually like sit back and kind of let the tide reside a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then when that period that happens where like most people move on and life Mm -hmm. continues, that's when Mm -hmm. I, that's when I show up. Yeah. Like, how are you doing now that the dust has settled? Mm -hmm. Um, But also I feel like that is kind of me. It sounds good, but also it's me being reactive if like I don't I'm afraid of approaching this right now because it's so hot Mm -hmm. so let me retreat for a little bit (laughs) yeah it's like twofold in that nature where it's like it's kind of thoughtful but it's also like self-preserving for myself Mm -hmm. (laughs) yes yes Um, but one thing I will point out we have known each other for several years Mm -hmm. and you use the written word to reach out to people. Yes. Yeah, because my when my father passed away, you mommy wrote me a beautiful card. Mm. And so you do even in that tense moment, which it, it can be. Yeah, because you don't know how the person's going to react. Yeah. Even in that moment, you yeah, so you do find different ways. Mm. But you're absolutely right. It's yeah, there's almost like two camps of people. There's people and I am one of these people. It drives my husband crazy. I'm one of these people that rushes in with food, with what is sitting, I'm a sitter, Yeah. whatever it is in that moment, I rush in. But then there is a group that kind of steps back. But to know that you come back, because when the world goes back to being the way it was before the loss or before whatever happened, the trauma, that is really hard. Yes. Yeah. 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 I remember sitting in a mall and my dog had died like a, a week or two before. Mm-hmm. And I was so angry at all the people. 
that were just buying shoes and buying clothes and buying. And I was like, okay, this is my grief. Mm -hmm. Number one, I'm not going to act on it for sure. But I realized that the world never changed when she, she lived 18 years and the world didn't change at all yeah. when she was gone. And so I'm not comparing a dog to a human, believe me, but that type of loss, even the top of a job loss, yeah, or you fell out of college or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. The world keeps going. And so to know that someone would come back after it's all said and done, that's very important. How do you deal with that fact of the world keeps going? Because mm -hmm. there's a period, it never, it doesn't get easier, but I be, you probably become more equipped over time. You do. Um, mm -hmm. But there's like a period where it kind of, I think lots of people say, okay, this has happened to me. This is my mm -hmm. life. If they're spiritual, they might say, I don't know what God's purpose is, but I trust him. Mm -hmm. How do they approach moving on? I don't know if I have a better word for it, mm -hmm. but like, I feel like there might be some, there's like healthy moving on and then like maybe unhealthy moving on. Uh -huh. can, is there a difference that you can articulate? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. That's pretty easy sometimes because unhealthy moving on could involve alcohol. It could involve drugs. It could involve well, yeah. it, whatever, just checking out of the world completely, mm -hmm. checking out of yeah your relationships. Yeah. So unhealthy is pretty easy. Healthy is harder, harder because each person is an individual. And so in some ways they'll move on in their own ways. Yes, there are things that you can do. There are people that you can listen to. There are experts that say this, this, and this. But what's so fascinating is even the experts, we came up with these steps of grief or whatever you're going through. We came up with these steps and we were like, okay, you go through this and then you go through this and then you go through this. Right. No, people jump around. Right. Yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah. And so you'll go up here and you'll think, oh, I've almost made it. And then you're back, you're back at number two mm. and it's like, wait a minute. And so it almost, it's, it sets a person up. And so it really is sitting down one-on-one, -on -one, or if you feel like you need to go to a group, like a divorce care or a grief care or something like that, or a celebrate recovery, that's fine too. But really today we're talking about one-on-one -on -one counseling mm -hmm. because you're an individual, you have a life that is unlike any other's. So it's very important for you to hear exactly what you need and that you get that by talking to a person one on one. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, you know, probably better than anybody that I am a big fan of books. Oh, yes. And so are you. Mm -hmm. um, so content suggestions are always welcome on this mm -hmm. show. What are some books that the person listening can read either to help them with this or to be able to help others with the area of mental health? Mm -hmm. I have a whole entire rack over here to my right oh. <laughs> that I constantly use in counseling. Sure so if do. I look to the right, <laughs> you'll know. Yeah, most definitely. You know, it really, the majority of them are topic specific. Oh. And so if you really want to know, if you want to know the science, but you're not into psychology, or you're not into, you don't want to, you want to learn more about mental health, pick up Atomic Habits, mm. that he uses all kinds of things in there that are psychology-based, mm -hmm. research-based. John Acuff is another author that does that too. I mean, he does the research. He has a scientist that does the research for him. And so it's really good. Right now, I'm reading The Noom Theory, which I think I have right here. Yeah. And so it's basically atomic. They're not going to like that. I say this. Oh, the new mindset. New they're mindset. not. So it's basically atomic habits for weight loss or change. Okay. Yeah. And then exactly the same way. Yeah, definitely. And then the one that I use constantly, if I'm working with a couple or marriage is under attack right now in our country. Mm -hmm. And so maybe you're thinking about getting married early or you've been dating someone since high school and you're like, now what do we do? Kind of thing. Read this book first. The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. Oh, and who's it's that by? Dr. Gottman, Dr. John Gottman. Gottman. John Gottman. Okay. He's a researcher in Seattle, and he's been doing it for like 42 years, 43 years, something like that. Okay. And so he's, you know, one of the experts. And then there's a whole list of people that you can read. Janina Turner is another one. It's, yeah, there's, and of course, let me think. 
because it's really, it depends on what you want to learn the most. Actually, it's Janina Fisher. It's simply looking for what you need. And sometimes standing in front of the self-help section doesn't really help because mm. <laughs> you're looking at all those titles. So you might want to go online and search exactly. If you're looking across from someone who is coming across their own childhood trauma, then you would want to go and look and see books on childhood trauma, mm-hmm. things that the body keeps the score. I'll put some of those links in the in the description for people so they can access them quickly. Good. Um, this is a newer question that I've started asking a lot of my guests. When you feel overwhelmed or unfocused mm-hmm. or have lost your focus, at least temporarily, how do you handle it? What do you do to get back on track? You mean besides listening to your podcast? Yeah, <laughs> right. Listen to all the episodes, binge it, uh-huh. then come back and do the rest of the stuff. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah, exactly. Yeah, I actually faced this earlier this year because I've had some health challenges. And sometimes whenever you have health challenges afterwards, you have a recovery period that I didn't realize I was going to go through because I am face first in everything. I'm like, let's go. Let's do. Let's yeah. let's see. And so I, yeah, I had to slow down and I had to look and see, okay, what is really going on with me? And so one of my favorite doctors told me that she's from Ghana. And she said in that some of the African nations, when someone asks you how you're feeling, they'll, you'll say, I'm, I've been sad. Yeah. And they're like, oh, really? For how long? And then they say, oh, for probably about 30 days. And it's like, wow. I mean, just to be that open yeah. about it's like, and then the way that the person was saying it, they're recovering from the sadness. Wow. Yeah. And because they paid attention to what they were feeling. And so that's what I started answering people as. I st- They would be like, hey, how are you doing? I said, I think I'm having a sad time mm-hmm. right now. Mm-hmm. And what was so funny is people were like, But then they would ask me questions or they would say, what can I do to help or whatever it was. And so I was like, wow, it's really powerful to be able to talk to your tribe. Yeah. To be able to say, hey, this is, yeah. And sometimes, oh, people cannot stand it when I say this. You have to sit in it. Are you overwhelmed? Are you underwhelmed? Mm. What are you struggling with? One thing is your thoughts driving you crazy. You have to sit in it. You have to write it out. And I'm talking about this type of writing, Mm -hmm. not on the computer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have to be able to say, okay, this is the way that it is right now. It's not the way it has to be forever. We can change things. What if you can't change things? Mm -hmm. Do you focus on you could change yourself or because some situations are just, it is what Mm -hmm. it is. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I've lived through those too. And you have too. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's changing your thoughts about it. Mm. Yeah, it is. Look at the evidence. No, because a lot of times our thoughts, and if you have depression or you have anxiety, then those two things will tell you certain things. And normally they're lies. They'll tell you that you're a failure, that you made a bad decision, or you just don't know what you're doing. They'll tell you flat out. And so you have to, in some ways, separate yourself from those thoughts and think that's not true. (laughs) It's just that simple. It's funny. I love Hunger Games. Mm -hmm. And inside Hunger Games, they talk about real, not real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it real, not real? Well, that's what you you can apply that to. That's one of my tools. And people always roll their eyes when I say many Hunger Games. (laughs) (laughs) But at the same time, real, not real. You're looking at the evidence. Sometimes also we go on the witness of people around us. Yeah. So we ask them, hey, this is what I'm thinking. Do you think that's true? Mm. Do you think that's, and hopefully it's somebody that will tell you the truth that yeah. maybe you do need to adjust a little bit. Maybe you are being too negative. That's what I was going to try to kind of ask next. Cause I mean, me being a type five. Yes superficiality or if that's a word is like ah, to me Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I like to go deep on everything Mm -hmm. and I've been really struggling with the whole 
euphemisms that we say as a culture is just like, hey, how's it going? Going good. How are you? I'm doing good. Yes. I'm like, you don't look like you're doing good. So mm-hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, and I've been struggling to lead the way in this because mm-hmm. it's just so programmed. Mm-hmm. Um, when someone says, hey, how are you? And I can actually respond authentically with how mm-hmm. I actually am doing. Or mm-hmm. someone says, hey, what do you do? Usually they're talking about what do you do for work or whatever. Right. And like, how can I respond in a way that's like, I like to play basketball. Like, <laughs> just breaking the trans of mm-hmm. superficial mm-hmm. communication. Mm-hmm. But I also feel like, and we talked about this actually in the the, the last episode. I, well, from this recording, I don't know how many, mm-hmm. but like, the difference between vulnerability and authenticity, whereas mm. like you can be mm-hmm. authentic with everyone being your true self, but that doesn't mean you have to be vulnerable with everyone because that can be mm-hmm. sometimes unsafe or unwise. Mm-hmm. So how do you determine when you can say or when it's appropriate, I'm sad or mm-hmm. actually share how you're feeling um, versus when it might not be the, the best time or the best person to do that with, or is it mad? Does mm-hmm. it matter? Mm, yeah. Yeah. My theory in life is that no one should ever feel less than around me mm. ever. And so that's why whenever I'm around someone and maybe it's somebody that I see every day at work or I just happen to see at the grocery store every other week or something, mm-hmm. whatever it is, there is an engagement there for me. There's a reason that person was placed there right at that moment. There are no coincidences for me. So I do not want ever to walk away and think, oh, I just made that person feel less than. Mm. And so that falls into the category of, yes, you can talk about their day, talk about, hey, I know that maybe there's something going on in their life. You can say, hey, I prayed for you this morning or I thought about you this morning, whatever. And that's kind of that is surface, but it's still okay because, I mean, I've looked at people specifically cashiers at the grocery store before and I've been like, hey, are are you okay?" Mm -hmm. Because you can sometimes see on their face Mm -hmm. or their body posture, whatever it is, that they're not okay. Mm -hmm. And I've had a cashier say, well, you're the first person to ask me that today. And she probably sees hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. Easily. Uh, Easily. And so, yeah, it's still surface. Even if I'm not okay, is the going deeper and that vulnerability that you were talking about. There's a safe place and a safe person. It's different for every person. It is. And so I kind of always thought that goes into the category of things that the colloquialisms you were talking about. I'm like, I cannot stand it when a doctor tells me it's different for every person. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, okay, okay, great. <laughs> Thank you for helping me That was me so, so helpful, much. right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I always like to follow it up, but I do like to say that because it truly is. Mm. There is safety in knowing how the person's going to respond. Or if you feel like they're going to respond truthfully to you, right. then that's, so we all have this group of people. I almost see it like a dartboard. And you're in the center. And so you have this group of people around you that are just one step out or two steps out Mm -hmm. on the dartboard around you, Mm -hmm. how they're going to react. For the most part, sometimes they'll let you down. Mm -hmm. It's it's humanness. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, but once you get out of sight of that, then you know that at that point, you're actually in some ways serving them so they can go serve someone else. Yeah. And so I love the fact that you're answering it differently because that's very important. My favorite one is, I'm so blessed. (laughs) Stop it. You might be blessed, but don't say it like that. (laughs) Yeah. And and that's the thing, um, especially with people that are religious or church people. Mm -hmm. I feel like on their part, and I understand it, I'm not casting blame or anything, where they feel like if they respond truthfully, It's a signal of ungratitude Mm. um, for what they do have because they have so many blessings Mm -hmm. because things aren't going 
the way they really want them to, or they have certain emotions that are going to happen because we are emotional beings. God created us that way intentionally. They don't express them because they feel like they have so much other things to be grateful for. Why should I express my negative emotions when I have so many positive emotions that need to be highlighted? Mm -hmm. So I get it, but it still bothers me a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and if it feels untrue, that's the part that bothers you. And it's, Two, I mean, a lot of people really don't want to burden someone else Mm -hmm. with what they're going through. But at the same time, if you answer the same way every time, they're going to stop asking (laughs) pretty much. Right. You know, and so why not? I, you know, hey, I love playing basketball. Mm -hmm. I am a daughter. I'm a wife. I'm a dog mother. (laughs) I'm all these things. And answering with what you do for a living is really really american yeah (laughs) it really is it's it's how we define ourselves yes and so it's really worth it to sit down right now at this point in your life and write down how do i define myself Mm -hmm. well it's what i love to read i also love to learn Mm -hmm. i'm a learner and so i love to go to classes i even enjoy ethics classes yeah and so and people just go (laughs) and so it's not it's not literally what you do for a living yeah it's not it doesn't have to be yeah, I think what I'm gathering from this is really you be the catalyst, you be the leader mm-hmm. in this situation. And we and we talked about this in one of my episodes about self, uh, not not self sabotage, about uh, decoding God's will. Mm. Is like when you're having conversations with, with people and you desire to go deep, you go deep first. So like, oh, that's good. Like you said, with hey, how are you feeling? Oh, mm-hmm. it's Lyric and Ringo. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was a little concerned about that. They've been so good. They have. They've been great. Um, They're welcome. Yeah. Welcome to the show, guys. When you have those things, those types of situations where it's like, hey, how how are you doing? How are you feeling right now? Like specific questions. I prayed about, Mm -hmm. I prayed for you this morning. Things where it's like it it goes just beneath the skin Mm -hmm. where they have to react differently than they normally Mm -hmm. would on autopilot can give room for you to also be authentic in the space because now that they see that you've gone a little bit deeper they respond in a different way which means you can react in a different way as well yes Um, yes that happened to me this week actually i have a friend who's going through a divorce and her father died a couple of months ago Mm. and so i I was walking past her and i was literally about to walk past her and i was like wait a minute so i did what i had to do and turned around and went back and i said so what is your biggest challenge and how can i help and she was like wow she was like I don't know how to answer that Mm -hmm. business, personal. What what are you talking about? And then I said, either one, just your biggest challenge. And she said, I really can't come up with any. What's yours? So I told her, Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, I did a dump right there, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right there. And she, she was like, wow, I really appreciate that. And then she told me. Yep. And so she honored what I told her. Yeah. And then she and it opened a door. Yes. That is the key. We are all running around. We don't have a whole lot of time. Like I said, I almost walked right past her. Right. So I am just as human as the rest of everybody. But at the same time, that's now become one of my favorite questions. That's what's your biggest challenge gold. and how, what can I do? That, yeah. That is so good. That is so, yeah. so good. It is so beautiful. Yeah. And I feel yeah. like any time that we do do that, that is us taking the time to just reflect Christ to somebody. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Yeah. He showed us Mm -hmm. over and over again. It's the woman with the bleeding. His, his apostles wanted him to keep going. Right. I mean, they had a place to go and a child to save actually, (laughs) but he stopped and turned around and called her daughter. And that is the only woman in the Bible he called daughter. So yeah, he showed us how to do it. Yeah. He really did. Yeah. Yeah. Earlier. Uh Uh-huh. So I want to talk just for a moment about the stigma of all of this that we've been talking about, Mm -hmm. because that's where people get stuck. They, they are either embarrassed because of the way society has set it up. They're uneducated because of the way society has set it up. Their expectations are wrong because of the way that society has set it up. You get it. Yeah. So earlier I told you that, oh, this doing this podcast with Cleavon will be fun. Then the doctor adjusted my allergy medication. So if I sound... Mm -hmm. So my question is, if I had said, 
oh, the doctor adjusted my lithium. Mm -hmm. And so I might be a little loopy or the doctor adjusted my aprazolam or it's just Xanax. So I might be a little slow. Would you have continued to listen to me? Yeah. So 1000%. And, and, and I think here is why that would not have thrown me for any type of loop. Mm -hmm. is because of my exposure to mm -hmm. I've had to pick up medication <laughs> for right. that type yeah. of stuff. So I understand how it is and how it's just like getting medicine for like your physical health. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> it's your brain. It's a part of like, so um, I'll be like, oh, yeah. oh that, that makes sense. Like if you're drowsy because you're taking mm -hmm. some type of medicine for like your allergies or you have mm -hmm. some type of pain medication or whatever, we wouldn't think twice about it. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. But when it comes to now, if I didn't have that exposure, mm -hmm. it probably would have, of course, you don't want to make anyone feel uncomfortable. I think that is human nature. But it probably would have made me think more mm -hmm. like, well, what is she talking about? Like, what is, you know? Right. You know? Yeah. Um, well, and yeah. that's what it, there are people in the world, and I'm not accusing anyone or anything else, who would question my credibility right. or question, yeah. yeah, question what I was saying. There's also people that would turn off the podcast. Because I was weak, I was uninformed, all of these things. And so we really need to look deep within ourselves. If you have someone that you come into contact with, and we both do, and so we're kind of in this special group where we do have people that we come directly into contact with that have mental health issues. Mm -hmm. But if you come into contact with someone at work, or you come into contact with you know someone on the street, or as long as it doesn't violate your physical as long as they don't come at you or are there, whether or they're screaming at you or whatever it is, you have certain rights to, but are you checking in with them? Are you telling them, hey, I see you? Because that is one thing. Whenever someone comes into my counseling office, they're like this. They're like, don't, mm -hmm. no, mm -mm, no. And for the believer, it's one of the few times they will say, don't look at me, Lord, please mm -hmm. don't look at me. I'm ashamed at the way that my thoughts are going. My mind is going the whole thing. They're like, don't, please don't. Our goal is that whenever they leave us, that they're like this, they're like Wonder Woman. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, here I am. Yeah. Here I am. And see me. Yeah. And so in order to do that, if they mention the fact that the doctor changed their medication and they're on Prozac now, if you flinch, they're never going to mention it anything again. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to look at the stigma. It really is. And what it, how it impacts your life. Yeah. I think I'm always uh, a type of person that likes to be the devil's advocate in lots of situations mm -hmm. because I just think there's edification and trying to understand both sides. Mm -hmm. So like, I know we we equate mental health to physical health a lot. Like, well, you go to a doctor if you're sick. Why wouldn't you go to a doctor if your mental health isn't, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I think there's nuance to it mm -hmm. because your brain controls everything else and not mm -hmm. the other way around, right? So your mm -hmm. your legs aren't telling you how, how to think or how to behave, right? Mm -hmm. So physical health it's extended away from behavior and decision making. Mm -hmm. When it comes to mental health, it's on the front lines. Mm -hmm. So I do think there is merit in some situations to approach someone that has mental health issues differently mm. than mm -hmm. physical health. I don't think that they're equal. Mm. Um, but I think there might be an educated way to approach it based on having some experience or having exposure or have, or doing the work to understand rather than to accuse or to assume. Mm -hmm. But I will say, I don't think they're the same. I just don't, I don't think they're the same. Yeah. I no. I hear what you're saying. If you can come as someone as a soul, mm. then that covers both. And so whenever you're looking at someone and you're like, this is someone that has a soul and Jesus loves them. And so you're absolutely right, though, about approaching them differently. I hear what you're saying, mm -hmm. even though sometimes they do go hand in hand. Right. 
Most yeah, definitely. If you have somebody that has cancer and they're having chemo and they have chemo fog, then you're looking at hand in hand mm-hmm. kind of thing mm-hmm. and they need your support. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, if you can approach someone as knowing that they have a soul, they are one of a kind and then find out what's going on with them. Because if you go, you approach them knowing that they have a physical problem, you might find out they have a mental problem. They most you likely know, do. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, it's very challenging not to, yeah. let me tell you. Or if you approach someone who has a mental problem, you might find out they have a physical problem. So, yeah, I hear what you're saying. They are very different and can be, but they, I really feel very strongly they cannot be separate. Mm-hmm. So approach yeah. them as a soul. And could you, mm-hmm. you kind of explain exactly what you mean by that, like approach them by, as a soul? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. We have a gentleman by uh, my business, by my office, and he sits on the corner every day, pr- pretty much. I, there's very few days that we don't see Max. The reason we know his name is because we stopped and talked to him. Mm-hmm. And instead of just handing him money through the window or not, I know there's a whole argument about that that we don't need to get into here. But my husband and I know Max. And he's if he's not there, we miss him. Mm-hmm. Because he, number one, he dresses in Washington commanders, everything, Mm -hmm. some Washington Redskins, but Washington commanders, everything. And we've sat and we've talked and we've said, Hey, what do you need? And so he told us what size he wears and his clothes. And yeah, he told us exactly what he needed. And so it's sometimes not everybody has the opportunity to do that. And so I'm not holding us up as these really great warriors for those that are experiencing homelessness. But at the same time, Max, to us, was a soul. He was a person. Yeah. And he, whenever all is said and done, he he sits there on the corner every day. And we see him every weekday. But, you know, we just took the time. And so time is what we're so short of. But I can't imagine not knowing Max. Hmm. Max has changed the way that we look at a lot of things. There is a, and this is, this is probably not going to make the recording and we'll wrap up because I know it's 10, about 8, 10 o'clock. I know, but you need to ask me the billboard <laughs> question first. Yes. So <laughs> I'll ask you the billboard question and then I'll ask this next question. Okay. Okay. And yes, this is the, the patented question. It's not patented. I, I stole this from somebody. Everything <laughs> is. <laughs> right. There are no new ideas. Uh, creativity is knowing how to cover up your sources. So if you had a billboard, Sponsored mm-hmm. by Stacy Stone or by your counseling practice, and everyone drove past it in the whole world, and they got to read the message. What would you want the message to be that they read? What's so interesting is that your discussion, your podcast with Doctor Daniels, changed the way that I think about all of this. Whenever he answered this particular question, mm. because I had gotten to a point in life where I was like, "Okay, I've accomplished everything. God is done with me." He doesn't have anything else planned for me. It was really, really a struggle for me. And when Dr. Daniel said on his billboard, he to heaven, (laughs) he would say, you are more. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I just burst out crying. Yeah. There's more. Yeah. 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 So as far as mental health is concerned, I would change it just a little and say, you matter. I So, and I, and I might do this. In fact, who, who was I talking on? Oh, I was talking with. Now I'm not going to be able to think of her name. Anyway, she. We. It was an episode on 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 creatives, um, mm-hmm. on creativity, and she's a coach that helps people with like creatives. Very interesting. And mm-hmm. she was like, "You know what you should do? You should like because I was saying I will actually put down a billboard." What she said, I was like, "I'll put down." A, she was like, "You should actually start a campaign and start putting all the messages you had on your show, on uh-huh. on like if you have the money, of course, like on right, actual but... billboards." And I was uh-huh. like. That is like a new bucket list goal of mine. <laughs> so like, you should, yeah, you should like partner with someone. Yes. But yeah. Oh, I think that would be a fantastic idea. The other thing is that there's someone painting signs that just say empathy. Yeah. On the, in the district. All around. So all around. The DMV, yeah. And that's all they want is for people to feel empathy. So yeah, there's definitely a way to get it out there. I love seeing those. And I would love mm-hmm. to see that big and bright as day you Mm. matter that could be the thing Mm -hmm. that somebody needs to just get through wow exactly yeah wow yeah thank you so much for coming on the show stacy this has been great you're so welcome so what was your other question my other question was there's a gentleman uh so i like to go to rock creek park often it's one of my safe havens um where i just Mm -hmm. like to go think 
and there's a gentleman um, on the way there on Missouri Avenue that sells water, right? Mm-hmm. He's been doing it for a number of years. I respect his hustle. I believe it's called his business called Homeless and Hustling. Mm-hmm. And um, I've given him money. I've, I've I've wrote him notes, things like that. But and this has been an ongoing thing with me. Like whenever I see those who are struggling uh, with being without a home, or clearly they have some type of mental health challenge or something, mm-hmm. they probably can't get work or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. I'm always torn with how to approach them. Mm-hmm. Do I give them money? Do I? just talk to them do i ask them mm-hmm. what they need do i offer whatever i have in my car like there's just so many situations and it's been very hard li- more recently because i carry cash less and less as we right yeah everybody does right, yeah as we go into yeah. this digital era so yeah i've just been wondering his name's alan mm-hmm. and um every time i see him i'm just like what do i do or mm-hmm. whenever i see someone that is in a unfortunate situation i'm just like i feel like i should be helping because like jesus said to mm-hmm. <laughs> but i really yeah. don't know what to do mm-hmm. yeah well i feel very strongly like the situation that i described about yesterday walking past her and i knew i was supposed to ask that question i believe very strongly in the holy spirit and exactly that type of prompting mm-hmm. and so being in tune to that which of course is so difficult sometimes whenever we're going through our day. But whenever you ask specifically, how do I do this? What do I do? That's a question literally for the Holy Spirit, because your Holy Spirit has designed appointments for you throughout the day Mm. and put people in certain situations with you. Mm. It's the grocery store clerk that I was talking about, whatever it is. And so each situation requires different instructions. And so you need to know exactly what the Holy Spirit wants. What is What are you asking of me? And also, too, if you don't do it, which I, I know sometimes it's really, really hard, especially if they're going to suggest. I mean, there was a couple at church a couple of weeks ago, and the Holy Spirit was like, tell them you're praying for them. And I was like, no, <laughs> I don't know them. Yeah. And their eyes got really big when I said it. <laughs> I was like, but it was obvious they were in distress. Yeah. So I said, I just want you to know that I'm praying for you and your family. And I smiled and turned around and walk off. And I was like, Ooh, that was awkward. Yeah. And, and so, but if I hadn't done that, I would have felt a disappointment yes. in my chest, yeah. a deep disappointment. And so pay attention to those little things. Yeah. The Holy Spirit is there for a reason. And there's a book called Seven Secrets of a Spirit-Filled Life or something like that Mm -hmm. by Jack Levinson. And he's kind of opened the door to everything for me in that way because there's so many different levels to it. And so I would definitely, you know, pay attention to that. And you know what? If you don't have our belief system and you're listening to this podcast and then you have an intuition, you have, you know, a voice inside of you yep. that is telling you what to do. And if you don't do it, then you feel disappointed afterwards. So it really is. It's a process that we go through in life. And it's one, if you listen to it, you will be surprised at how everything changes. It's like a legit it, dopamine hit. Like you just, It really it, is. It's a drug. Yeah. <laughs> it does it's, it's, it, it does yeah it's, it's really good it, it feels awesome and sometimes like mm-hmm. you say like the couple was just like and okay. like this is awkward and that's happened to me crazy like, white lady a lot of times like <laughs> i offer somebody something and they like cuss me out or whatever or yeah oh yeah we've done that too know, yeah um definitely yeah. yeah but at the same time you did what you were supposed to do yeah yeah. So that's what matters. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Okay. That makes me feel better. Uh, Good. How, yeah. About how to how to approach it that each situation is unique, and I just mm. need to seek the Holy Spirit. It is. Yeah. yeah and just remember that they're God's appointments. Mm-hmm. They He sets them up. Now that part, I think that's gonna make it in because that's deep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, I answered it both ways so that you could put it if you want. To. Yes. Wow, what an amazing conversation with Stacy! I hope you got value from that. One thing that really stuck out to me was treat them like a soul. But that also applies to you, right? That also applies to me. We have to treat ourselves like we are a living, breathing soul, not something that has to be a perfection 
or masterpiece. You are a work in progress. And this is helpful for me because mental health is something that I just, I never really took the time to look into it. I've been doing more and more intentional work about understanding how this is a huge aspect in me building my vision. All the things that Stacy mentioned in this episode, the books and things like that will be in the description. You could click there. Plus, I'll put my resource library that has a ton of resources. That's anything from books to software to products that you can use to build your vision that's inside of my online community. I'll put the link to that in the description as well. Hey, look, keep building your vision every single day and Take care of your mental health. You are a soul. God made you special and he loves you very much. If you know where that's from, you you know. All right. Peace, y'all. Bye.